I'm going to start with a, an essay that a student of mine wrote now nine years ago. So I, it will help you to, in order to understand what I'm going to talk about today, to know that I did a doctorate in political theory, uh, and then I actually became a school teacher. I taught middle school in the Atlanta public schools for three years, and then the Boston public schools for another five years. And it was only um, after, and I had two years of a postdoc uh, in, in the middle there, and then it was only after that about decade of being a middle school teacher that I actually came back to academia and started uh, being a professor at Harvard. And so this um, essay that I'm about to show you is an essay that one of my eighth grade students wrote in Boston. I call him Jaquari um, uh, for the purposes of public talks and for publication. The, he wrote this essay as part of a final exam uh, that was given district-wide in the eighth grade civics in action course that I taught. So in Boston at the time, um, civics, eighth grade had no state mandated content in civics. And so a very enterprising deputy superintendent said, uh, we have, we'll take this opportunity to do civics rather than say yet another round of American history. Uh, and so, and there was a, tradition in Boston of having sort of district-wide exams to see if all of the kids across the district were doing about the same thing. So in this exam, he had to write an essay, he had to write, answer 25 multiple choice questions, and then write two essays, all in about 45 minutes. Um, and this essay question asked him to identify a problem uh, that existed, say two different po competing positions on the problem, uh, give three reasons in favor of each position and then say which position he favored and why. I should say it was not a terrifically constructed uh, question, but here I'm going to show you now Jaquari's answer to it. So the question that he asked was, should Boston build parks to reduce his violence? As you can see, what I've done is uh, written this out, uh, transferred it verbatim. Yes, they should build parks to reduce his violence. No, they shouldn't build parks to reduce his violence. That was his taking the two competing positions. One reason why they should is to keep the peace. The second reason is to have a place for children. And the third reason is to have a place where we can run free. One reason why they shouldn't is, the, is because there will be shootouts. Two reasons is because people will be smoking and drinking in the park, leaving trash behind them. Three reasons is because gangs will be hanging out uh, late in the playground and be destroying it with spray paint. So he's followed the direction so far, established the two positions, given three reasons for each. Now we're going to find out what he thinks about this. Ooh, click. I really think they should, yet then again, they shouldn't. Because when there are different gangs con contacts, the fights always be in the parks. And suppose there are a whole bunch of little kids in the park, and then there are a group of gang members standing or chilling out there. Then the enemies come over and start shouting at the others. Then someone loses a kid over someone else for nothing. Example, when the girl was trying to leave the park in Grove Hall, which is a local housing project in Boston, because of a gang, then as she was walking out the park, she got shot in the back and died. So this was Jaquari's essay that he wrote for our final exam. So what teachers do, um, uh, one of the things that teachers do is they spend time looking at student work as a way of trying to understand what do students understand, how do they understand the assignments, what's going on here, what are they doing well, and what as teachers do we need to sort of hone in on to help them do. Obviously, one crucial thing that is not going well for Jaquari as a 15-year-old eighth grader in June of his eighth grade year is his academic knowledge and skills, right? We see an enormous example of what has become known as the academic achievement gap, right? He, Jaquari is African-American and he exemplifies what in this country has come to be recognized as the shameful uh, lack of academic rigor and academic learning that schools in the United States have provided for African American and Hispanic students as opposed to what they have provided uh, for white students and what poor students like Jaquari have been able to receive as opposed to higher income students. But that's not the only thing that's going on here, right? Another thing that's going on in addition 
to the academic achievement gap is that Jaquari experiences parks in a way that are, is profoundly different from how, say, I have experienced parks in my life. He experiences them as profoundly anti-civic spaces. He would like to see them as civic spaces, right? He would like to see them as places where the community can come together, where kids can play and so forth. But what he really fears, ultimately, is that they are going to be a place of conflict and of death, right? That is, again, very, very, very different from my experiences, in some cases of the same parks, because Jaquari and I live on opposite sides of the largest park in Boston, Franklin Park. And his understanding of the park is really as a p place ultimately of danger. There's another thing that's important to understand, which is that Jaquari also has insights because of his experiences of parks as compared to mine that provides insights into both the benefits and the risks of building parks specifically to reduce violence. So again, as somebody with very different experiences from Jaquari, if you were to ask me, should we put money into building parks in Boston, I would have immediately said, well, of course, right? It's a place where kids can play, kids are cooped up too much, they're, you know, whatever, you can have basketball courts, whatever. The, the kinds of answers that I would give as a citizen to this question about building parks, even specifically in order to provide safe places for youth, would be different from the kinds of answers that Jaquari gives. And that is really, really, really important because as we know, this is a picture of Tamir Rice, uh, who, as I assume you know, it's a 12-year-old who was shot and killed in a Cleveland park last year. These things have life and death consequences and people like me, who look like me, who have my background, who have my set of experiences, are not the only people who should be contributing to decisions about, say, when and where and how we build parks and how we think about how they exist as civic spaces. However, that is what is generally happening in, in the United States because there's very, very low probability that a student like Jaquari or an adult like uh, the adult that Jaquari has now grown up to become, uh, will be able to bring about civic or political change in this country. Uh, and this is because of a phenomenon that I call the civic empowerment gap. So the civic empowerment gap, sort of just to give you a definition, is a persistent and pervasive gap in civic and political knowledge, skills, attitudes, participation, and impact or power between those who are middle class or wealthy, well-educated, white and natural born citizens on the one hand, and those who are low income, not in possession of a college degree, members of an ethno-racial uh, minority group, or a naturalized citizen or a non-citizen on the other. What does this mean in practice? It's a sort of long definition for a phenomenon that I, I actually think we all are quite well aware of and will recognize. And what I want to argue we need to take as seriously as we take, say, the academic achievement gap that I talked about earlier that Jaquari's essay also demonstrates. So let me just show you some very st simple statistics about how the uh, civic empowerment gap plays out across a number of different dimensions of our uh, civic participation and our civic experiences. With respect to voting, for example, black and white citizens are 50% more likely to vote than Asian American and Hispanic citizens. Note, this is about citizens. This is not about whether or not, say, it is true that whites and blacks are uh, to a greater proportion citizens than Asian Americans and Hispanics. But even among citizens, they are 50% more likely to vote, both in um, general elections uh, and in primaries, and also in presidential election years and in midterm election years. Citizens with an income of greater than $75,000 a year are 50% more likely to vote than with citizens with an income of less than $30,000 a year. Similarly, college graduates are actually twice as likely to vote uh, as those with no high school diploma, and this rises to two and a half times as likely uh, among young citizens, those ages 18 through 29. Uh, I have gone through, I've sort of started researching this um, beginning really in about 2004, um, 
which is when I took a couple of years off in the middle of my teaching to try to figure out how I, I as a teacher, should be trying to help empower my students, who were mostly uh, low-income uh, students of color when I was teaching in the Atlanta and the Boston Public Schools. And if you look at the data from 2004, 2006, 2008, 2010, 2012, 2014, it is shockingly similar. I've updated these slides sort of over time. You know, I used to sort of talk to my faculty meetings and eventually I started you know, talking at conferences, et cetera. The numbers changed very, very slightly, but these patterns have remained shockingly similar, in fact, for decades. It's not just things like voting. It's also all sorts of other forms of participation. So this is a very hard thing to read. I, what I really wanted you to do just is to be able to get a sense that if you look about at the top row, those who are directly involved with the civic group or activity, uh, only one third of those who have uh, less than high school um, are directly involved with the civic group or activity. It's basically double that for college graduates. And similarly, if you are very poor with an income of less than $10,000 a year, maybe about 40% of you are in some way involved with a civic group or activity, that rises to more than two thirds of you if you have an annual household income of over $150,000 a year. If you look at other forms of participation uh, that are not being directly involved in a group, but simply communicating, whether offline or online, you again will see that by both education and by income, those with higher levels of education, those with higher levels of income, are generally twice as likely to even have contacted somebody to be talking with others about issues, to have some way of actually making a difference about the policies that we have uh, and the practices that we have going in our, on in our civic and political life. Uh, and these participatory gaps are echoed by attitudinal gaps. So if you look at political, and so the things that, cor the attitudes that correspond with political and civic participation are political and social trust, Political efficacy, meaning that you believe that if people get involved, they actually have the capacity to make a difference. Personal efficacy, meaning that I believe I have the capacity to make a difference if I get involved, right? A political and civic identity, and an identity is I am the kind of person who does this, who gets involved, who say votes, I am the kind of person who uh, works with others to try to solve a problem. And a sense of civic duty, it's my responsibility to get involved. Except for political and social trust, uh, the other four, I should say political and social trust is unusual because depending on your place in society, you may actually be more likely to get involved if you are less trusting. Uh, but these other four, a positive correlation with civic and political participation uh, and a negative correlation with poverty, minority status, and immigrant status. So it's not surprising that there's, there are these gaps in attitudes, right? I'm not meaning in all of that I'm presenting to you about the civic empowerment gap to suggest that citizens of color, that low-income citizens, that those who uh, are not college graduates are somehow wrong, deficient, uh, you know, not understanding who they are and what their responsibilities and their roles are by being on the lower end of the civic empowerment gap. Because our experiences, going back to Jaquari's essay, right, our experiences as citizens and as residents in the United States are profoundly different uh, from one another. Unfortunately, really every year it's possible to mine a new set of data demonstrating these ethno-racial disparities in attitudes that are related to ethno-racial disparities and um, income disparities in experiences. What I have here are simply um, pictures of racial profiling, 9-11, um, actually I don't think I have 9-11, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Jeremiah Wright, uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, immigration laws and dreamers, Black Lives Matter, right? Every month this past year, a new set of experiences has come to the public for but it's not that it's only over the last year that these kinds of uh, different experiences have defined groups' experiences in the United States, right? It's only that it's now coming into 
mainstream media attention, and frankly, to the attention of especially white middle class and upper middle class Americans, who have been able essentially to shield themselves and ourselves, I identify as a white middle class American, from the experiences that others have had in the United States for so long. And because of our differential civic experiences, it's not at all surprising that we also have differential civic attitudes, that we participate in different ways. But unfortunately, even though it's not surprising, it has fairly catastrophic consequences, which is that only some of us have a voice and only some of us are able to help define our civic and political collective life, define our policies, define our practices. Uh, we have, I didn't want, since I'm giving this talk in Chicago, um, some of you may be aware of the hunger strike, right, that recently ended in Chicago after 34 days of civic activists trying to save um, Diet High School, right, and this is a quotation from um, one of the activists, that it's 2015 and not 1950, and black people have to go on a hunger strike to get a neighborhood school, it says to me that I'm not even human. Right? These are the different civic experiences that we have in our lives. And they have profound consequences for how we lead our civic and political lives together. So, um, my argument is that we need to achieve the same kind of transformation in our collective attitudes about the civic empowerment gap that we have achieved, I think, for, for the most part, about the academic achievement gap. So at the beginning, I talked about how Jaquari's essay was an academic catastrophe. There was not a single sentence there that was properly punctuated. They all had spelling mistakes, right? Uh, there were, I mean, it was, a, it was ungrammatical. It was, it was an academic catastrophe. And that is something that when I started out as a teacher in 1996 in Atlanta, Many of my colleagues and many, of, say, people in the media would pl place that academic catastrophe in Jaquari's body. They would say, he doesn't care, he doesn't try enough, he's distracted by basketball or by girls or whatever, it's too bad that his mother must be working two or three jobs and can't pay attention. The problem was placed with him and with his family. And over the time that I worked as an eighth grade teacher, one of the things that I found extremely salutary about the United States was that we started to shift that narrative. And no longer did we place the academic failures of especially black and brown low-income kids in the United States in the bodies of those kids themselves. Instead, we transferred it to our system. And we said, no, we are at fault. Our schools are at fault. Our educational systems are at fault. If we have these patterns, that means that we are the ones who are constructing them and we are the ones who must deconstruct them. And now there is a nationwide rhetoric of closing the academic achievement gap because we recognize there is no reason located in the bodies of low-income black and brown kids that they cannot learn as well as higher income white and Asian kids. There's no reason at all. The reason is our systems and our schools. And so we are responsible for changing that. But still with the civic empowerment gap, we are equally aware that there are these differences, right? We are equally aware that despite having an African American president, there are very, very, very few African Americans and Hispanics in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, in other positions of power, even as aldermen, right, at the state level, all throughout our system, from the very, very local level to the highest federal levels, we are massively, massively underrepresented by ordinary Americans who are low income, who have less than a college education, truly less than a graduate school education, and those who are not white. But for some reason in this country, we have come to take it as simply a given, that's the way things are, right? It's too bad, but what could you do about it? And what I wanna argue is that we have to take the same kind of re responsibility as a system and as a society for the civic empowerment gap as we have taken, in rhetoric at least, for the academic achievement gap, 
All right, so what does this mean? First of all, the civic empowerment gap is just not inevitable. The gap in the United States dwarfs the gap in other countries for which we have comparable measures. And within the United States itself, the gap has grown significantly over time with respect to education and income. We can't exactly tell how it's grown with respect to race because it's only relatively recently that we stopped officially disenfranchising, say, African-American citizens and stopped, say, having uh, people pay a poll tax. So we can't trace on race, but we can definitely trace on education and income and see that the gap has grown over time. And many identifiable causes of the gap including gerrymandering, political party mobilization practices, and the collapse of trade unions, which historically were very effective at mobilizing poor and working class members, they're socially and politically constructed. They're not natural phenomena. They're things that we are doing as a society. The civic empowerment gap is also shameful and harmful. I mean, I've already suggested that in part, but I want us really to recognize that we betray democracy when some individuals or groups systematically find themselves excluded from the halls of power while others slip easily inside. We undermine democratic legitimacy when some seem to stand above the law and others are subjected to its full and even brutal force. And we have seen a lot about that brutality over the last 12 months. But again, that brutality is not new. There is in fact very little that's novel about the brutality that we've seen over the last 12 months, except that it's become public, right? That it's, become, that it's spread beyond the neighborhoods in which it's usually located. And furthermore, as I suggested when I started with Jaquari's essay, democratic deliberations and decisions are likely to be actually of lower quality if people are representing an old uh, um, sort of narrow range of experiences and interests and backgrounds are involved. Part of the beauty of democracy when it functions uh, inclusively and effectively is its ability to create aggregate wi wisdom and good judgment from individuals sort of uh, necessarily limited knowledge and viewpoints and skills. So to exclude citizens like Jaquari, to exclude citizens like those who are constructing who are doing the hunger strike outside Diet, to exclude citizens like those who are condemned as rioters in Baltimore or in Ferguson or in New York, uh, from this process is to diminish our collective wisdom, and it's actually to weaken democracy. And in that respect, it impedes individual self-determination. And this is because empowerment is a collective condition. It's not just an individual possession. And I think this is really important because this is something that we get wrong in schools a lot. Right now in schools, what we tend to do is tell low-income kids that what they really need to do is work hard and escape where they came from, right? If you work hard, you can achieve, you can graduate, you can get to college, and you can escape. That is not a message that my guess is most of us sitting in this room tell our own children, is that if you work hard, if you succeed in school, you can escape our family. You can escape where we live and who we are and leave us all behind. But that's the message that we're right now giving, especially literally millions of low-income kids of color every single day is that your ticket to leading a good life, a life that you care about, that matters, where you actually have a decent job, where you can raise your own family in safety, where you might be able to let your kids go outside and not worry that they will get injured or killed simply for playing outside, is that you need to leave behind where you came from. And that is a tragic choice. And in that respect, that's why I say that empowerment cannot be thought of as individual. It has to be thought of as collective. That we do not have, individuals do not have power unless they have power together in relationship with one another, in the context to actually change the community. If what has to happen is that the neighborhood needs to change so that they can actually live in their home neighborhood and get a good job and raise their children safely, then that's what needs to happen. Rather than consider some neighborhoods or some entire cities as being zones merely to escape and where those who are still living there are simply left behind or forgotten or abandoned. 
Um, and until we manage to see empowerment as being collective, we will not uh, be able to actually enable the kind of self-determination that matters. Uh, and schools, unfortunately, are exacerbating the civic empowerment gap. This is the reason I draw the relationship between the civic empowerment gap on the one hand and the academic achievement gap on the other. It is not only schools who are exacerbating it. Right? As I made the reference to trade unions, to gerrymandering, to political processes, we could talk about Citizens United. There are a lot of things that are helping to construct the civic empowerment gap. But unfortunately, schools are involved. Low-income students of color, especially in de facto segregated schools, get a significantly worse and more disempowering civic education these days. They have systematically fewer opportunities to acquire academic knowledge and skills, uh, which in itself could go a long way to mitigating the civic empowerment gap, because remember, when you saw those graphs before, education level was the greatest predictor of civic skills, of civic participation, uh, of civic attitude. So if all we did was actually reduce the academic achievement gap, that would go a significant way to also reducing the civic empowerment gap. But there are a number of other things also that schools do right now to exacerbate the civic empowerment gap. Uh, they give low-income students of color fewer opportunities to study civic content before they leave school, uh, to participate in debates or mock trials or service learning or other kinds of guided experiential civic uh, opportunities to learn in an open classroom climate where they can actually hear other students' viewpoints and debate with one another. Uh, such schools also have generally a systematically disempowering culture. Uh, Low-income students of color are denied opportunities to make choices during the school day, even in such small things such as walking from one classroom to another or deciding where to sit at lunch. When I taught in Boston, for example, we told our 14-year-old students, our eighth graders, many of whom say we're responsible outside of school for caring for their younger siblings or their nieces or nephews, for taking their grandmothers to the hospital and, or the doctor and translating for them, for uh, working jobs in order to support their own families, in school, we told them what table they had to sit at in the cafeteria, and we often told them that they had to eat their lunch silently. Right? The ways in which our public institutions treat young people, and in particular young people of color, exacerbates the civic empowerment gap by, treating them, by teaching them that they are not worthy of respect, that we as a society do not view them as worthy of respect or capable of controlling themselves even to the point of controlling their own bodies. Um, this is a photograph of the bathrooms, actually, in the school that I taught at in Boston uh, that some of my students took uh, for a citizenship project that they did. Uh, but of course, um, these kinds of examples also can be uh, unfortunately updated. Uh, many of you may recognize this as an image from the video that went viral last week at Spring Valley High School of the police officer, the white police officer who took down a, an African-American 15-year-old girl who refused to put her cell phone away or exit class when requested to. These kinds of moments of education matter. They teach our young people whether or not they are valued members of society, whether they are worthy of respect, whether there is any possibility of change if they try to get involved, and what the dangers are if they do try to get involved, if they do try to stand up and say, no, I disagree, I have a different idea, I have another opinion, can I introduce a problem that we haven't yet talked about? If these are the images that students have in their minds, it is very unlikely that we are going to shrink the civic empowerment gap. So, my argument, you know, very simply, is that all of us, educators, policymakers, researchers, citizens, we share responsibility for the civic empowerment gap just as we share responsibility for the academic achievement gap. So now the question is, so what do we do? Right? I've so far uh, spent half an hour painting a very grim and depressing picture. Uh, and as somebody who believes in civic empowerment, I actually think that our goal is to leave here with ideas uh, for how we can actually make a difference and to have some sense of power ourselves. So I'm going to talk quickly about how educators and schools can make a difference. In order to know how much time to spend on this, can you raise your hand if you currently work in a school or with a school? 
Okay, great. So I'll spend a little, uh, some time on this, not a huge amount of time. So to start with, for those of you who are teachers in the social studies, in history, in uh, you know, economics, social studies in general, civics, there's a huge amount, frankly, that we could be doing differently in order to help uh, address the civic empowerment gap. Part of it is we can actually make sure that kids have the opportunity to talk to one another, have the opportunity to express each other, express their own ideas, and to listen to one another and try to collectively problem solve. There's research showing that in the average social studies class, students spend no more than 1.6 minutes in the entire class actually having a discussion. And that number goes down in low-income schools, less than 1.6 minutes per class, okay? So one thing is that we can actually get our kids talking to one another, problem-solving with one another. We also need to be attentive to what students come in knowing and thinking, right? So uh, that means that when we teach American history, for example, we need to recognize if our students come in with a different understanding of American history that we ourselves may have. My conception of the United States is very different, and my possibilities for action in the United States is very, very different from my students. And that's because, first of all, they were right. They had different possibilities for action than I had as somebody who was white and middle class and frankly knew a lot of people, it turned out, in government. I went to Yale as an undergraduate. I went to Oxford as a graduate student. Uh, you know, you start to know people. My sister worked in the Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division. I knew people who were Supreme Court clerks. There were ways in which I had massively more quick access to power than my students did. And there were ways also that even if we were talking to the same person, I would be paid attention to far more readily than say my students would. Uh, so that is one set of things. I think I accidentally pressed stop. Yes. There we are. Great. Okay. Um, so one thing that we need to do is actually start teaching, giving children an opportunity to talk to one another, listening when they express opinions about, say, the United States and their place within it, rather than merely telling them, you know, what a good citizen does, listening to them and asking them and help them construct more empowering civic narratives. But also, whether or not we teach social studies or English or French or science, or baseball, or whatever it is that we teach, there are a bunch of pedagogies, of teaching techniques that we can use, where again, we help students feel as if they are respected, and we help them develop the civic skills in order actually to pose problems, to work together, to try to find out, well, who else is actually working on that? How do we understand evidence here? How do we craft evidence into a proposal that somebody else might pay attention to? How do we take account of dissenting voices? How do we look at the landscape around us and figure out where a lever of power might be, how we can fit in, rather than just saying, oh, the system is broken, you know, forget it, nobody cares. These are the kinds of things that we can do in every class. And in every class, we can ask students for their ideas. In every class, we can try to help teach them how to talk to one another, rather than in a hub and spoke, where they're always channeling their conversations through us as the teacher, and we are in the position of evaluating it and commenting on it, but rather actually getting them to speak to each other. Giving them some freedom and saying, okay, you have a project to do. You have this essay to write, you have this presentation to make, you have this experiment to do, and I trust and respect you enough that within these behavioral guidelines, you will get it done. I'm here to provide support, but you are somebody who we actually will trust to be able to make a difference and work together to solve a problem. Uh, in terms of classroom and school and uh, district culture, I showed you the photos of, say, the bathrooms at my school, the McCormick, uh, and, say, the still from the video at Spring Valley High School. These are, and I talked about, say, the cafeteria, right? These are all features of school and classroom and even district culture that can be profoundly alienating and profoundly disempowering. 
but it's not that hard to make a change. Where again, we say to students, you know, to 14 year olds, we trust you to be able to manage your bodies as you walk in the halls. We actually trust you to be able to decide where you sit in the cafeteria, to monitor yourselves going to the bathroom, to be mo role models for the sixth graders or the third graders or the kindergartners. These are things that we could do rather than say having zero tolerance policies where we say, well, say um, I had a student some years ago who wore a bicycle chain, uh, or like one of those chain locks that you use for your bicycle, uh, as a very heavy necklace, because she was sort of into neo-goth punk. Um, and that got her expelled, because it was a weapon. Instead of doing that, if we started just asking students, talk to us, what are you doing and why? Tell us what you need. Tell us how you perceive what we're doing in this school. When I taught in Atlanta, we had our vice principal stood outside the uh, school every day and wanded our students with a metal detector before they walked in. And these were sixth graders who were still trading Pokemon cards at the time. Right? And I never asked them, so how did it feel to you to be inspected for weapons every single day? and to interrupt your Pokemon trading card projects. I actually interpreted it as being a horrific assumption that we were teaching them that they were being viewed as uh, incipient criminals. But I also know that many of the students actually felt that our school is a very safe place and we're very appreciative of that. I don't know which way won out because we didn't ask students and that's something that's extremely important. If we also give kids opportunities to exercise leadership, it doesn't only have to be debate or newspaper uh, or you know, service learning, civic action projects, all those are great. Also leading a manga club or a bicycle club or a French club or a hip hop dance club. It doesn't really matter. These kinds of leadership opportunities are crucial for the civic empowerment gap. And then also getting them involved in governance at every level. It seems extraordinary to me that we have students write every day for 13 years, from kindergarten through 12th grade, because we know that's what it takes to make good writers. We have them do math every single day, from kindergarten through 12th grade, because we know that's what it takes to make good mathematicians. We have them, kids who are doing baseball, they are practicing every day after school. They start doing preseason and postseason. They're playing three or four games a week sometimes. And we do that because we know that that's what it takes to be even a good like intramural bas baseball player. And yet for citizenship, which is the one thing that we know every child is going to grow up to be, whether or not they are a legal citizen, they are going to grow up to be a member of our society with rights and with responsibilities. We spend almost no time in school having them practice being citizens. It's crazy because in fact, many kids are not going to grow up to be baseball players or mathematicians or writers even, right? It's important we're having them do math and English and so forth. I'm not saying that, those, that we should reduce those, but it is utterly insane that the one role that we know every single child is going to grow up to have is the one role that we tend to teach about for a semester in 12th grade. So students need opportunities to practice citizenship. Um, and I'm going to skip the standard stuff, although I will say that one of the things that Illinois is doing remarkably well on is that there's now a new sort of voluntary national framework called the C3 College Career and Civic Life Framework for Social Studies State Standards. And Illinois is one of the states that has actually embraced these and has now revised your social studies standards in order to embrace, uh, in order to be in, in line with this. And one of the great things about these standards, which I should say I was on the writing team for, so I'm not a totally independent uh, voice on this, but is that they have this inquiry arc that concludes with community, communicating conclusions and taking informed action. And so it actually has civic life um, built into it, which I think is terrific. So very quickly, to wrap up, 
That was sort of how educators in schools might make a difference. Now the question is, how can all of us make a difference? So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you are a citizen, whether that's a legal citizen or a resident here, because I'm going to assume that all of us are that, right? And so the question is, how can we make a difference? One is, I think that if you can, if we can advocate for civically empowering content and pedagogies and practices for all youth, that is huge. There are changes that are being made. Your governor, for those of you from Illinois, uh, just signed into law a bill in August that now requires a civics course in high school. Illinois was one of the 10 st states that did not have such a requirement until now. Um, but there is a lot more that can be done, right? If we could get civics to the point even that baseball is at, right? That would be huge, let alone getting it to English and, uh, and math and science. Uh, again, there are a number of civic engagement initiatives. Chicago is replete with them, in fact. Uh, there's the Mikva Challenge, there's the Constitutional Rights Foundation, both here in the city. Uh, at the statewide level, there's the Illinois Civic Mission Collaborative that's uh, part of what's been responsible for helping to get uh, the C3 frameworks accepted and the new bill adopted. If you can support through your time, through your money, through your uh, social networks, civic engagement initiatives, that is a way to help create a more inclusive democracy. Also, if we can think about how to engage with youth, to participate with them, not just on their behalf. My assumption is that many of you are here in the room because you care about education in some way and that you in involve yourself in education. And one of the things that we often do as adults is that we involve ourselves for young people. That's good, but we also need to start involving ourselves with young people. Help them be the citizens that we are by working together. That itself has an educational function for them because they will help, uh, that will help them learn how to learn citizenship and practice citizenship, but also for us because we will get into conversations with people like Jaquari who we don't frequently enough listen to and work with. So the more that we can engage with youth and seek out diverse viewpoints and coalitions, the better off we will be. And finally, uh, this is probably my one ideological plug that I'll put in. Um, I've been talking with others about the movement over the last year, say starting with Ferguson and moving forward. And I see thinking about the civic empowerment gap and trying to combat the civic empowerment gap as one very, very small piece of what I think ideally should be the new civil rights movement. What's interesting is that we tend to talk about the civil rights movement as something that happened and that finished out sometime in, say, the early 1970s. And that's actually long enough ago now that it's time for us to start a new civil rights movement, one that is inclusive, that helps to combat injustices that we are still aware of, and that has youth involved as they were involved 50 years ago, again working with us to start a new civil rights movement to help to create a more inclusive democracy. So I'll say, if you're interested in this, I have a couple of books about it, No Citizen Left Behind, uh, and then this co-edited one that I edited, Making Civics Count, and I'm also very, very happy for you to get in touch with me, Mira underscore Levinson at harvard.edu, and I think it's now time for questions. Thank you. Great, I'll be coming around with a microphone. Uh, please speak into the mic, thank you. Having had some experience with my grandchildren, one of my grandkids in a school with a heavily mixed population, is the people you're talking about see no future. And so it's hard to get them to study, it's hard to get them involved when they see no future for them in this country. How do you deal with that? That's a gap that I don't think we can handle. So I think actually that is a misperception. If you look at, uh, so both, I'll give sort of an anecdote and also the research. The research does show that uh, low-income kids and kids of color actually have equally high aspirations for themselves as, say, white kids and middle-class kids do. They actually say that they want to go to college at the same rates. They describe the same kinds of jobs that they want to get in the future. 
and they described the same kinds of aspirations. That was true for my students as well when I taught eighth grade both in Atlanta and in Boston. The difference, however, is that, say, kids like me growing up in a white middle class household with college educated and actually graduate school educated parents knew others who had walked that trajectory. And we had others who could then guide us on that way, oftentimes without our being aware of it at all. Right? But say, my students who I taught and students who are attending de facto segregated low-income schools and sometimes mixed schools, they know many, many fewer adults who have actually walked that way. The only adults that they necessarily know are teachers. And some teachers are fantastic at helping to guide them on that journey, and other teachers are not. Other teachers actually assume that the kids themselves do not have aspirations, do not see a future for themselves, and then reinforce this blockage. So I don't think that it's actually about seeing no future. I think it's not knowing how to get to the future that they see, but just is across such a great gulf. Hi, thank you so much for uh, everything you've shared today. Uh, as somebody who was a former public school educator and now works for an education nonprofit in Chicago, actually based out of Boston, but working with a, a range of teachers in CPS and suburban schools, um, I'm curious what you would recommend. Like a lot of your talk focused on things that need to happen importantly for historically uh, disempowered or under-resourced communities. But given the new state mandate, what would you say we could do for students in privileged and resourced communities to create awareness of these things that are going on? Because I think that's half the problem a lot of time. Like people don't know this is what's going on historically and now, and how do we make that happen so that there's advocacy and change from, from those places as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll give two quick answers. One is, this thing about practicing citizenship. So kids in privileged communities have more opportunities to practice citizenship in a variety of these informal ways, such as leading, you know, participating in extracurricular activities, leading clubs, um, uh, having other kinds of leadership opportunities. But what they don't have much more than, say, kids in low-income communities is opportunities actually to practice the, civ the civic coalition building, to hear people and meet people with uh, viewpoints and experiences others, other than their own. And we have very, very few examples where we actually bring kids together in common to work on problems or talk about issues that they uh, say, you know, identify as important. And given the affordances of digital media right now, you know, texting and WhatsApp and Instagram and cell phones and, you know, let alone com mere computers, right? It's not that hard. It's not that we have to get on buses and visit each other's communities. It's that we could actually work together, practice working together with different others to solve problems. So that's one thing I would say. And then the other thing I would say is that, I talk about this in a bit in No Citizen Left Behind, just like I think low-income kids of color need practice actually doing citizenship as a way of developing civic identities and developing a sense of efficacy, a belief, oh my gosh, I actually can make a difference if I do something, right? Um, privileged students, I think, actually need experiences where they uh, come under what uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, called double consciousness, right? With privileged students and with privileged people in America, say whites being the most obvious example, I tended, I was raised by parents who tried to develop a political consciousness in me, but basically seeing myself as the norm, right? And others were interesting, you know, divergences from the norm. W.B. Du Bois talks about how African Americans do not ever have that experience of seeing themselves as the norm, right? That there's always this double consciousness, where there's the consciousness looking out, but also as being seen, right? The consciousness of how you appear to others. And I think that if we can help white students and wealthy students and other privileged students develop that kind of double consciousness where they no longer see themselves as the norm and others to be accommodated or dealt with, but actually see themselves being looked at by others as being potentially sort of odd or having culturally specific practices, that is another kind of civic education that I think would be important. Hi. Um, okay, so 
I, so I'm a person of color, I'm Latina, and I am the first person of my entire family who graduated college. And it was very much a difficult struggle. And I honestly think as a young professional and also as an activist, the biggest problem and psychological thing, barrier that I have to get over constantly is not feeling like I'm some sort of a charity case mm -hmm. or like I'm the exception to the rule right. or the whole fact that oh, well, you're smarter than everybody else. Obviously, you had drive. Nobody else cared. Right. So my question is, how can we make it to a point in which we see everyone as equal? Yeah. I wish I had a good answer to that, right? Um, you know, I have two responses, neither of which is an answer. One response is that this is part of the reason that it's important to help people understand how structures work and how institutions work and not just uh, how interpersonal relationships or individuals work, right? So when you think about why you feel so unusual being a first generation college graduate, Latina young professional, uh, and that it's not that the rest of your family didn't have drive, didn't see a future, wasn't smart, right? But there was a whole set of factors that have been built into this country from its founding, right? And built into economic uh, structures, into banks, into housing practices, into schools, into in everything. Part of it is helping people see the structural and the institutional whole within we're, which we're working, right? Um, but that's not easy, and that's not going, you know, and there are only so many times that you want to try to make that argument before you just want to go home and say, enough, <laughs> like, let me turn on the TV and veg I just can't take anymore, right? Uh, I think the other issue, um, the other response, which is also not an answer, is helping to make visible that you're not actually alone, right? That there are many, many, there are, there are actually millions of young Latina and Latino students who are going to college, who are graduating from college, who are getting good jobs, but right now, every single one of those million is being seen as an exception. And we have this narrative, right, that young Latino and Latina kids or young African American boys and girls, or, th or that immigrant kids, or undocumented kids, that they are, that they don't have this um, trajectory. But you do have this trajectory. And we have to tell the story so that that becomes part of the story that's accepted and recognized, rather than a story of exception. That's again not an answer, but <laughs> that's, a, that's a response. I, I love your idea of um another civil rights movement and the need to sort of make some overarching changes in American higher ed or American education, higher ed as well. Yeah. Um, but what you're talking about in, the, in an overarching way requires that we really change the learning environment, which really has policy implications in terms of how do we focus on standards and the academic uh, the achievement gap versus the civic gap. There's only a finite amount of time in the learning experience. Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing is I'll say, if you think about the list of things that I gave, only one of those was really about content and changing, say, what we teach. And even there, it's not necessarily trading out some content for another and sort of fighting for our space. Like, I am totally uninterested in fighting the arts to say, no, more civics rather than more arts. I'm not interested in fighting English or math or PE. You know, I believe in the obesity ep epidemic. What I, you know, that, so I don't, so I think it is wrong to say we are another special interest pleading for time or attention in the curriculum and we're opposing other special interests, right? Instead, what I think we need to realize, and part of the reasons that I showed pictures of bathrooms and talked about parks and other things, is that so much of this is actually about how our civic 
experiences are structured as a whole. And it does not take time out of the curriculum or attention away from, say, standardized assessments or whatever it is to have extracurricular activities, to have students involved in classroom or school or district governance, to give students opportunities actually to talk with one another in class without it's going through a teacher, to allow students, in fact, to, say, walk themselves from class to class. All of those things are just part of the normal fabric of the school day. And if students experienced civically empowering opportunities throughout the school day, as opposed to civically disempowering and disenfranchising opportunities, they could sp spend equally many instructional minutes on English and math and science and baseball or whatever, right, as they do now. But they would experience that differently, and they would develop civic identities and attitudes and skills and knowledge that, was qu that is quite different. Um, Similarly, say when I showed the C3 frameworks and the, uh, the image of this uh, sort of you know, nationwide attempt to reframe social studies education, there is a, the second uh, part of the inquiry arc is disciplinary knowledge and skills. And in the civics part, a lot of what we have there is starting with, from kindergarten, say kids practicing and learning different ways to deliberate or to make decisions where they might decide, say, even as first graders, are we going to do a majority vote or are we going to try to come to consensus on which author we look at for our author study? Right? That's something where kids can learn civic skills and learn civic practices and develop civic identities, again, without trading off with these kinds of instructional minutes. But I will also say this can't all be done in schools, any more than schools can eliminate the academic achievement gap by themselves. I mean, we place every single hope on schools in the world because schools are the only public institution that serve 90% of our young people, and so we expect schools to solve every social problem and every political problem and every civic problem we see. They cannot do it alone, but they can do it. They can help to do it somewhat. Thank you. <laughs>